Pope Francis recently made a controversial statement about the diversity of religions being willed by God, while defying calls for female ordination. Still, some are charging the Pope with heresy. Bishop Athanasius Schneider is here with exclusive analysis. And what's the secret to dealing with hardship and the unpredictability of everyday life? Fox News host and chief legal correspondent Shannon Bream shares her life lessons and a new memoir, Finding the Bright Side. And we'll tribute the late great comic legend Tim Conway. The world over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. An important show for you tonight, Bishop Athanasius Schneider, Shannon Bream, and a tribute to the late Tim Conway. It's all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover. Let's get right to it. My first guest has been both a Miss America finalist and an attorney. She's currently the host of Fox News at Night, and serves as the network's chief legal correspondent. Her journey from the law to journalism hasn't always been a smooth one, and she's here tonight to talk about how faith, family, and persistence have seen her through the hard times. She's also the author of a new memoir, Finding the Bright Side, the Art of Chasing What Matters. Here's my exclusive interview with Shannon Breen. Shannon, in the book, you describe your poor mother as the meanest oh, yeah. mom in the world. Mm -hmm. But she did keep you on the straight and narrow. And I want to share a line from the book and get your reaction. You say, my childhood is one that many people can't comprehend, especially in today's permissive society. But it made me exactly who I am. Mm -hmm. Curfews, rules, and embarrassing parental displays, they all kept me from making mistakes I couldn't undo. Mm -hmm. That's true. Why? Well, you know, my mom, literally, when I call her meanest mom in the world, she's not insulted because she bought herself a plaque that she found at a yard sale that literally said meanest mom in the world, and she hung it up in the kitchen. And she was one of those moms who's like, I love you. I'm not your BFF. I'm oh. here to enforce rules and keep you mm -hmm. out of trouble. And, of course, our home was all about growing up in faith and trying to live a different life. I mean, not be like all the rest of the kids, you know. Yeah. If all your friends said they were jumping off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? <laughs> the typical conversations. But really when it came to, you know, my friends who would start getting into things like underage drinking and partying and all kinds of trouble, my parents really gave me a strong backbone mm -hmm. to say that, you know, peer pressure, I get it, but I kind of knew I was never really going to be one of the cool kids. Mm -hmm. But my parents really gave me an out because I could say, mm -hmm. oh, my parents are going to kill are, me. They're awful, Blame it on them. And it really did keep me out of a lot of trouble in high school. And now you're a cool kid, Shannon. I don't know. Well, I've seen the dance party on Friday night. <laughs> right. I still are. think back about the Coke bottle glasses and the braces, and in my mind, I'm still there. <laughs> okay. I love the story about your mother. She taught at the school, Ugh. and she dresses up as Madonna Ugh. during... <laughs> Yes, 1980s now, Madonna, explain, not, real, yeah, not the original current, Madonna. No, I would hope not. A lot of collagen <laughs> for that. Um, a lot of <laughs> injectables. There's a lot going on. Tell me why she dressed up yeah. as Madonna. You were mortified at the I time. I was. Um, Madonna had been on the cover of Time magazine and was this huge phenomenon in the 80s. And I said to my mom, like, wouldn't it be so cool to be Madonna for one day? Mm -hmm. Just thinking, I mean, it looks like her life is a lot of fun. And my mom was horrified because she was, <laughs> Madonna was everything my mom would totally was against. And so a couple of days later, I'm in class where my mom is a substitute teacher and she shows up dressed as Madonna <laughs> and saying like and for sure and the whole valley girl thing and i just wanted to die but she i think was trying to embarrass me like she always was but i think too she was sort of um coming from the the viewpoint like maybe it's not cool to be a madonna but we're going to mm -hmm. take a day of embarrassing you in front of your high school friends and we'll see and you were raised in a religious family yep. i mean and and uh, yeah and not only was it taught but it was lived yeah and i i love that when you make the decision to go to college you mm -hmm. go to liberty university mm -hmm. why liberty you know, my parents had instilled in me this idea of continuing in my faith. I knew mm -hmm. Liberty was one of those places after I visited where I would get a good academic background, but I would have teachers and fellow people on the dorm, roommates, 
that were coming from a spiritual place that wanted to continue to grow in their faith. And it was a real part of their life. This wasn't, at that point, um, I think to make a decision to go to a school like that, I mean, you really had to be committed in your faith. Mm. And not that we were all perfect Christians, we're flawed, we're learning, we're young. Um, but it seemed like a great place to go where I could have a lot of fun. And my parents basically said, if you're going away from home, it better be a Christian school. <laughs> There's so. a line that your mother imparted to you. And I, I want to use this because it runs through the book and this relationship with God is throughout, the, mm -hmm. throughout your life, and, and you see it at various stages, and we'll talk about it. But there's this line from Philippians, you quote, you write, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Mm -hmm. You say that's hard to do, yeah. easy to say, hard to live. I think all of us come from a sinful nature and we have ego, especially those of us who are in this crazy business that we're I, in. Don't look at me that way. Not you. Saying. You're the exception Thank to the you, rule. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> but some people in the business, not you. Um, it's hard because if you're in a medium or in a city like Washington, D.C., where there are a lot of big egos, you're around that kind of flavor and people telling you that you do a great job and you're mm. beautiful and you're funny and wonderful. And I think you just have to be realistic with yourself. I mean, because mm. to me, it's not about me. Um, I'm trying to live out God's purpose and what he has for me and everything to me pales in comparison to his glory and who he is. Yeah. And my mom was always big on that verse and saying, really look at helping other people, taking care of other people, worrying about their problems. And she lives that like nobody else I know. Well, I, when I listen to you interview people and I listen to a lot of people interview people, you can always tell somebody who's humble because they shut up long enough to listen because they know they don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And you do do that. I don't know. I should make Thank you aware you. of that, but you do. Um, and and I think not only do you get more out of your interviewees mm -hmm. as a result, but it it allows you to learn things as well. Mm -hmm. And you you're learning it in real time. Mm -hmm. And is there an, any truth in that? I love it because I feel like. It's such a privilege to do the job and get mm -hmm. to pick people's brains from the president on down, whoever mm -hmm. you're interviewing. Everybody's interesting and knows more about something than you do, whether it's policy or you know immigration or international affairs. I love it. I feel like the job, I get to learn something every day. And I know there's plenty I don't know. So I love that part yeah. of it. Now, you're studying law. You're in the middle of your, your career at, at, at Liberty. And then you decide to go and compete in a beauty pageant. Oh, yeah. Uh, not one, many <laughs> beauty pageants. Yeah. Where did this come from? You know, I was one of those typical little girls with my mom and grandma. Every year we'd get around the TV and watch Miss America. Uh. And everybody seemed so glittery and polished. <laughs> and who doesn't love a sequin? You know, I, it looked very glamorous to me. And as a little kid, I would watch it, but never really think that could be me. Hmm. But then when I was in college, I saw a poster on campus uh. to come be in this local pageant, which would lead to Miss Virginia, which would lead to Miss America. And I thought, the first year I was too scared to even go to the meeting because I thought everyone's going to laugh. What are you doing here? Yeah. Um, but the second year, I got up enough strength to go to the meeting and kind of hear what it was about. And there was all this great scholarship money, which I needed. Yeah. Um, and it, it looked like a really challenging, fun, crazy thing to do. And so I just dove in. And was it? Would you, would you allow your daughter to do such a thing? Not until that age. I don't, it, for me, I, it wasn't a kid mm -hmm. thing. My parents never wanted me doing right. that kind of stuff. I was in college. I was 19. Yeah, you, yeah, so you, I felt like, for me, it was decisions. a positive choice. I, I ended up getting to travel all over the place. Mm -hmm. It forced me to do public speaking and things that were terrifying when you're 19. Mm -hmm. And just to become more self-sufficient. And it paid for the rest of my school. Yeah. So for me, it was really a win. And then you go back to school. You go back to Liberty. You date this guy, Sheldon. And then you find out he has a brain tumor. Yeah. Tell me about that. You describe it as one of the darkest periods of it your really life. It really was. I mean, you don't think when you're 24 and newly engaged and you have your whole life ahead of you, you're so mm. excited, that you're going to run into something like that. But life is unpredictable. And that's one mm. of the things I really wanted to share in the book that we all, I know, go through dark times and mm. unexpected, really things that feel like a punch in the gut and you don't know how you're going to go on. Um, and he was having hearing problems and that kind of thing. Eventually, they go through months of testing, finally figure out, we need to rule out this one thing. And then they come to us and say, it's a brain tumor. Oh. And um, it really just put our life on hold for a couple of years. And wow. it was um, one of those times where I, I tell a story there too. The word starts to spread and people say, we'll put you on this prayer list and all mm -hmm. church will pray for you. And we got in one particular rough day, we got a letter from a church in Alabama. I've never met these people. Mm. I didn't know them. And they said, you don't know us, but we heard about your story through such and so and such and so. So we put you on our prayer list and we're going to be praying for you. And it was that whole period of time was such an example of like the body of Christ. People mm. who we don't have to know each other, but we're brothers and sisters and just lifting each other up. Mm. And it was a really long, tough recovery. Um, but we learned a lot through it. had it. to be terrifying. How did it change mm -hmm. you? How did it change your idea of relationships mm -hmm. and a person you love who mm -hmm. could be taken from you mm -hmm. at any moment, which is the reality of every moment? Yeah. 
was really nervous to get married. Uh, my mm -hmm. parents' marriage did not last, and I was very gun-shy about getting married. I wanted to be a career woman and do my own mm -hmm. thing. Um, not that I didn't believe in love and family and that kind of thing, but I thought maybe it's not for me. And as much as I loved my husband, Sheldon, um, at the time my fiance and then dating, this whole thing woke me up because it, it made me mature very quickly and it made me realize the thought of not having him in my life, I couldn't see that. And I just wanted to commit to my life together with him as my partner. Now, you were studying law at the time. And then in the midst of this, you decide, I want to go be a news person. <laughs> Where did this come from? Oh, I have always loved current events. I yeah. love the news. I, I, you know, talk about how when I was a kid, I would sneak down the hallway. My parents would stay up late on election nights watching, oh, you know, the covered. returns coming in, and I'd be sneaking behind the couch and wanting to see who was going to be the next president. My mm. parents would be like, go to bed! <laughs> but I loved that. I had such a curiosity about it. But when I was in school, my dad said, you're either going to law school or medical school. Pick one. He wanted his daughter to have every mm, advantage yeah. moving forward. So after I practiced law for a few years, I couldn't get that out of my system, this whole idea of getting into journalism and news. So I started at the very bottom rung, mm. um, um, making coffee and answering phones in the newsroom, and I immediately fell in love with it. Wow. The first boss, the, the guy who hires you, he's fired. Yeah. The second boss says the delightful quote, <laughs> you are the worst person I've ever seen in TV, and you'll never make it. Yes. Today you would say what to him? Um, Have you met him again? I have not seen him again. <laughs> I did one time. He was time, fired. That's I was why. out. I was out on let a, Shannon Bream out. I was out on a run one time with my husband, <laughs> And not too long after this happened, and we ran by him in a very crowded area down in Tampa where we were living at the time. Oh. And I waited until we got a few blocks past him, and I said, do you remember the guy with this? It was a very distinctive shirt he had on. He was like, yeah, that was kind of a weird shirt. And I was like, that's the guy. And I named him, and he just turns around and says, I'm going back. I'm like, no, 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 like jumping on his back. <laughs> it's over. This is a very small business. We don't want to do that. But I would say to him, you know what? You kicked me out of the nest, and that was a good thing because mm -hmm. he forced me to think about do I really want to be in this business? How can I get better? I need to improve. Mm. Um, and it kind of lit a fire in me to prove him wrong. So yeah. I, it was a good thing. Yeah. Not at the time. Yeah, well, not, <laughs> but for now. His, not for his career trajectory <laughs> either. I don't know where he is now, but uh, I wish him well. Then you go to Fox News. You meet uh, Brit Hume, our pal mm -hmm. Brit Hume. Um, he refers you to Fox. Fast forward, you do write about Roger Ailes in the book. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, tell me the pros and cons of Roger Ailes. A, a man that we both know, yeah, knew. Yeah, a TV genius, mm -hmm. a communications genius. I mean, he worked on presidential campaigns. Yeah. He just had a real knack. Theater, I Merv mean, Griffin right. show. Yeah, I mean, I love that show. I used to watch with my grandmother. I Me love too. that show. And I feel like he, he just was an, a master communicator, and he got what people click with on the screen. I mean, he just, mm -hmm. I think what you could argue he was better than anyone in being a, an engineer in cable news, pioneering all of these things. Yeah. Um, but for me, I mean, I also, and, and he was very charitable. We all know stories about people within the company who fell on hard times or health um, crises, and he never abandoned anyone, which mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. uh, that's an amazing thing. No, and he kept people he hired. He did. He knew from very the loyal. 60s. Yep. And some of them are yeah. still working at Fox. Very loyal. Now, for me, as with some other women at Fox, mm -hmm. there were uncomfortable situations and conversations mm. that I was in with Roger that put me in a bad place. I mean, I'd been a sexual harassment attorney, so I knew the whole landscape of, yeah. you know, how this would work. And I had a fear that if I went to anybody within the company, it would just go straight back to Roger because, you know, he was very mm -hmm. much the one running the company. And so I had to make a decision um, how I would deal with those conversations with mm. him and say, you know, am I going to laugh along, try, try to extricate myself from the situation? Mm -hmm. um, and I came to a point where I couldn't do that anymore yeah. um, because it just became too uncomfortable for he me. He promised you a show at one time. And mm -hmm. you write that you felt that you were being asked to give up your own values mm -hmm. for some of the things he was asking yeah. you to do. Yeah, in some of those tough conversations, he would talk about sex appeal. Mm -hmm. He would often use more colorful language. Oh, well, and, and talk about how, um, you know, I needed to present a different image if mm -hmm. I really wanted people to connect with me, especially men and viewers that we wanted mm -hmm. to draw in. And um, he talked about different camera angles and highlighting parts of your body and things that to me as a journalist shouldn't have been my most important thing, mm -hmm. wardrobing and different things like that. And um, at that point that he had promised me, come talk to me about a show. I mean, I'd been at Fox for years, and I thought, this is amazing. Is I went moment, to him, yeah. right, with my proposal. I had all written out ideas and graphs and charts and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, as soon as I got into that conversation with him, I was like, here's my charts. I want to walk you through this, my ideas. Mm -hmm. And he immediately tossed it to the side and I began engaging in these conversations again. I thought to myself, mm -hmm. 
he didn't mean it. And, and this is not a conversation I want to have anymore. And so I told myself when I left that day, I wasn't going to have these private meetings with him anymore. And I never did. I never mm. saw him again. And you sort of let go of that idea. I did. Because I thought, yeah. you know what, if I have to sacrifice in a way, if that's what it takes to get to the next level, the Lord has this all mapped out. God has a plan, and I am perfectly happy where I am, and I have to trust that He's bigger than any of us or any plans, or anybody, yeah. any earthly plans. And so mm -hmm. I just had to let it go. Yeah, I know. Sometimes letting it go is the most powerful and important thing you can mm -hmm. do, yeah. which you did in that situation. Um, there was a, I read an interview with you. I can't remember if it was here. I, I have, believe it or not, a dossier. Oh, no. On Shannon Breen. It's not from Interviews Russia, is it? At, no, no. The <laughs> steel had nothing to do with it. No, uh, no, no, no British spies. But uh, in one of the interviews, they asked you, how do you, when you're when you're in the intense glare of a breaking Supreme Court decision and you're on those steps, and there are people yelling around you, and you've got a producer in your ear, and you go live, mm -hmm. how do you hold it all together? Mm -hmm. And in that interview, you said, I think to myself, humbly, grateful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? I say that a lot of times as I look into the camera before we start the show or in a situation like that because I feel like wherever you are, God has placed you there for a purpose and you're not there without his hand and he's watching over you. And I'm thankful to be doing something I love so much and to be in that mm -hmm. moment in the middle of history. But I think it sort of resets you and calms you a little bit too to say, you're in this moment for a reason. Um, you're equipped, you've learned things the hard way and the smart way, mm -hmm. but you've put all these things together to get you to this moment. So just do your job. Mm -hmm. I, I was shocked to learn until I read it years ago in one of those inserts in the paper mm -hmm. that you had this corneal difficulty mm -hmm. with your eyes. Mm -hmm. Now, when you first go to the doctor, he does, and when I read it, when my wife read it, she said, oh my gosh, this is just what she had thyroid cancer. Uh. And repeated visits, the doctor said, well, you know, you are getting a little older, and right. you, know, you slow down, and this is what happens to gals yeah. your age. Yeah, I, and it I turned basically... out she, had well, she went to the female doctor, thyroid cancer, boom, she filled, figured it out one time. Yeah. The doctor tells you, well, your eyes are getting drier, and right, this is right. what happens. Yeah, and that was the first doctor that I'd seen. He was the guy who did my contacts and glasses for mm -hmm. years. When I went back to him the second time, to his credit, he said, you have something more serious going on. He acknowledged that, and we need to get you to someone else, mm. to a specialist. But that second doctor that I went to, I went to him more than once, and as my condition was accelerating, what was happening, and I didn't know it at the time, but I was literally tearing my corneas oh my on goodness. almost a nightly basis. And it would, no one could explain at that time, but it was only happening once I fell asleep. Oh. So to be startled awake like that to the point where I would be sick to my stomach, the pain was so intense. Intense pain and double vision. So I, could, yeah, so I couldn't sleep, which I was desperately exhausted. But now I had gotten to a situation where I was living in chronic pain. That made me very empathetic. That was the lesson from that. But that second doctor I went to, I went back to him and tried to explain how bad things had gotten. And he said to me, you're very emotional. And I thought, yeah, yeah I am. Because at that point, I was sort of falling apart. But that kept me from going to the doctor for months after that because I kind of have, had given up. And I just went to a very dark place where I felt like I didn't have any hope. Yeah. Surgery, then you had the surgery. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it better now? Years Do you later. still suffer yes. from it? Yes, yes. Um, it's a genetic condition, so there's no real cure for it, mm -hmm. which is one of the tough things I discovered along the way. But there's a surgery that really gives you like 90, 95% improvement. And I put it off for years because there's a, a time of recovery. Um, but I have a great surgeon uh, in Washington who finally said to me, I think it's time we need to get serious about this. Mm -hmm. And it's been a great improvement to my life. And really, you know, that was one of those things that, that my faith alone sustained me during What that. would you tell people who are in similar straits, maybe not mm -hmm. a, a, a health malady, mm -hmm. but are in an emotional hole or in a relationship mm -hmm. difficulty, where they're trying to find that mm -hmm. bright side, where do they mm -hmm. go? I mean, for me, it has always been founded in my faith because in the worst moment when I finally found this great doctor, I was still living in enormous pain. I go to his office and he says to me, I know what you have. I have this moment of joy. Mm -hmm. And then by the end of the appointment, he said to me, but you should know there's no cure. I could not get to my car fast enough. I felt like I had nothing left to live for. I mm. could not envision living anymore like this. I was so distraught. And um, I'm not someone who thinks I hear the voice of God, but there was mm -hmm. something in my spirit as I cried out to him and was praying that he said, um, I will be with you. Not, I'm going to heal you. You're never going to have a pain again. Everything's mm -hmm. going to be great. It was only those words, I will be with you. And it was all the comfort I needed in that moment to just keep going and to just trust him. Um, so for me, there's no deeper well to go to in times of trouble than my faith and God's promises. And they're all through scripture. Mm -hmm. 
And um, it was just really the only thing that could be comforting in that moment. You're anchoring the show every night at Fox at 11 p.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm. uh, you're still the Supreme Court yeah. correspondent for the network, so you're up at the crack of dawn when, those, when June rolls around mm -hmm. in May. If you couldn't do that any longer, hmm. what would you do? What would I, you like to do? I always used to say NASCAR driver. <laughs> because anyone who's driven with me knows that's actually true. Um, I don't know. I love to travel the world. I don't know how you make a living doing that, but I love to see other cultures and go different places. But there's this a part Fox of me. A Fox Nation travel show. A travel show. Shannon. The two of us on the road. <laughs> oh, there you I go. I mean, I'm just saying. Um, as long as we had a small band. Right, because along with they us. would be singing and dancing. Everybody <laughs> praying. Yeah, that's happening. Um, I don't know. I, there's also this part of me that dreams of moving to some great little southern town, not a big one, um, and opening like just a coffee shop in a bookstore. Wow. You just meet people and talk to people and have real time for relationships. And sign copies of <laughs> well, you know. Finding the Bright Side. <laughs> we will stock that. Yeah, the, the, I'm telling we'll you, this will be one. a wall in the, in the Bream. You'll stop by. What do you by... call it? Bream Grinds or... I don't know. I had a friend who was going to open a religious bookstore at one point and said yeah. they wanted to name it Holy Grounds. Holy Grounds. It'd be a coffee yeah. shop and, and religious there. books. And I thought yeah. that was very cute. Yeah, so I can't cute. steal it. But Shannon Bree, thank you for being here. Thank as you for always. having me. I know it's going to be a big hit, Finding a Bright Side, The Art of Chasing What Matters. Thank you for identifying what does. Thanks for having me. Finding the Bright Side, The Art of Chasing What Matters by Shannon Bream is available now in bookstores everywhere and online, and you can catch Shannon weeknights on Fox News at night at 11 p.m. Bishop Athanasia Schneider is coming up in a moment. This is a don't-miss interview on the latest from Rome. But first, we lost a comic giant this week. He made us laugh for over 50 years, from his start on The Gary Moore Show to McHale's Navy to his 11-year stint on The Carol Burnett Show all the way to SpongeBob SquarePants. Tim Conway was a national treasure. I had the pleasure of interviewing Tim twice over the years, and we remained in contact. We spoke at length about his incredible body of work, the source of his comedy, and his faith. He passed away this week at the age of 85 after battling dementia. It was always such a joy each time we were together. Here are some of the best moments from my interviews with Tim Conway. <laughs> Let's talk for a moment about your faith growing up. Mm -hmm. How important was it in your house? You weren't born Catholic. In, uh, no, no. Uh, I was born, my mother was Romanian, and um, so she was Greek Orthodox. My dad was Catholic, but he had left the church. He was an orphan and came over here when he was 16 by himself mm -hmm. from Ireland. My mother came from uh, Romania when she was, she came over when she was 16. So they came over at a very young age, and uh, I, Religion was important to me because I learned about religion. I went to Sunday school, I went to things like that, mm -hmm. but there was no formal stuff. When I was baptized, uh, when I was young, uh, my mother had had a lot of problems with me before I was born, and uh, a lot of, uh, she could barely eat anything and all of that, mm -hmm. and I had colic for six months after I was born, so I was a mess, and they you know, were annoyed with me, and I'm <laughs> lucky I'm here. They go, yeah, get him out of here. Um, so when I was baptized, it was Greek Orthodox, and they put you on a little uh, platform. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the priest walks around, and they uh, hold on to a praying cloth kind of thing, and they walk around, and uh, uh, everybody is praying and everything. And since I was so old, because m normally you're a couple weeks old, yeah. you're not going to go anywhere, but I was about six months before I was baptized. So as they're walking around, I had fallen off the uh, platform and uh, nobody knew it because they're all praying so everybody looks up and the priest is going and my <laughs> my dad goes he's risen and, my, and the priest said no he's fallen somewhere <laughs> could, uh, does anybody <laughs> so yeah they looked around finally found me and uh, you I flipped was, onto yeah, the floor. yeah I was under the thing yeah Oh my. So uh, I could have been still there, you know. So, so doing pratfalls from the very beginning. Though. Right away, I was into that. Yeah, I love it. No problem. And then you go off to college. You're at yes. Bowling, you're at Green State. Mm -hmm. You converted to Catholicism yes. there. Yes. What was it? What was it? Was it well, I was became. I always had a, a touch with religion. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't think it's all a mistake, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, let's put up yellow drapes. <laughs> you know. No, I think somebody had some. Um, so when I, uh, Father Oliver uh, was there, it, it was really like Bing Crosby and uh, Barry Fitzgerald. This, this old priest couldn't believe that this young guy was doing the things he was doing. And we're uh, very good friends. Uh, did a lot of uh, work with the Newman Club, and uh, it just was it's such a, a wonderful life 
to be with him and the four kids that surrounded him that were very good friends of his. And, you know, he'd drive like a maniac because he knows where he's going if he gets killed, <laughs> but we're all going, oh, my God. <laughs> and um, so it, would, it, it just, I actually was thinking of becoming a priest. You know, you would go really? to con confession with Father Oliver on a, on a Saturday and you would hear the Notre Dame game on the radio in the confession. On the other yes, side of the yeah, screen. Right. <laughs> yes, so I have my sins and the thing and then you know, I was scoring the confession on a Saturday. So you could go in and say, um, Father, forgive me for I've sinned. I committed four murders last week <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry, Father. Yeah, well, I'll tell two Hail Marys. What? Because <laughs> the radio was <laughs> the radio playing. Was playing. Yeah. What's the score, Father? Oh, <laughs> shut up. Get out of it. <laughs> so that, this was a way of cutting down on oh, the yes, penances yes, then. Yes, yes, just yes. ask about One the Hail game. Mary. Yeah, get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're interrupting the play here, kid. Yeah, right. So Father Oliver then was a, was yes, a, a, big a inspiration. decisive, yeah. really shaping force. A guy loved life, I mean, you know, I mean, and knew where he was going and just it was wonderful, you mm. know, so. Uh, because you see, I have to say, one sees that with you throughout your career. I mean, and I've seen clips of you for when you're when you're very young, yeah. even to now. Yeah. There is this joy, and it's an infectious joy that people catch onto, and children yeah. catch onto. Yeah. Well, I think there's a security in it. I, you know, I, I can't imagine people who think that uh, they're not going somewhere when this is uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> over, as mm -hmm. they say. But uh, even if you aren't, it's a great way to go through life. You know, just believing that uh, you know that's. I've always been. Want to be kind and gentle to people, and I, I think it's paid off. Not, I wasn't looking for monetary reasons, but I mean, mm -hmm. for an audience to enjoy what we do without the fear of uh, nudity or language or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I, of course, around my house there is, but certainly not on the air. <laughs> <laughs> and violence, a lot of violence. A lot of oh, violence. Boy, okay, geez. we won't get into yeah, that. Yeah, no, no, Please. no. no that's, that's... You worked at a TV station in Cleveland. Yes. In your, in your, um, really very near your home. Mm -hmm. You were doing, uh, I, I came across some people on a book tour not long ago who actually remembered you from oh, really? this station. Oh, yeah? You had a comedy. Uh, it was a, a comedy well, duo, yes? It, I came out of the Army. Uh, I'd spent two years in uh, defending Seattle, and as you know, we were not attacked. <laughs> not attacked it. at there all. There you go. Make note of that. And I came back to Cleveland, and uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I wasn't really looking to become an entertainer. I was looking to be a jockey, as a matter of fact, because I weighed so little. My dad was training horses, so I was mm. galloping them in Cleveland. And then uh, this guy called from KYW in Cleveland, and he said, uh, you know, there's a guy leaving here. Um, why don't you come down and take his job? What is he? He's a comedy writer. I said, what? Well, you know, I, I don't, you know. So he said, well, the guy he writes for isn't that funny, so it doesn't have to be hysterical. You know, just <laughs> <laughs> write some uh, mild jokes. So Rosemary from the Dick Van Dyke Show happened to see that coming through, and she said, this is funny. I'm going to take this to Steve Allen. Mm -hmm. hmm? Steve, a huh? couple of shows there, and boom, uh, they called me for Mikhail's Navy. What did you learn from him, from Steve Allen, working with that oh, troop? Oh, what a, what a guy. Talk about I an mean, innovator in television. Oh, gee, I mean, you know, Steve would write 30, 40 songs a day, a couple of books, you know. I mean, he's just politically inclined. Uh, it was, he was unbelievable. And every word that he ever spoke was in order. Sentences were perfect. I mean, it was comedically amazing. He was just, he was my idol. And of course, the guys on the show, Don Knotts, Louis and I, Tom Post, and the mm. men on the street, I just lived to see that show at night and uh, always had admired Don Knotts because he did kind of what I thought if I was ever going to be in the business, I would want to do that. This kind, gentle approach to people, to humor, to an audience, to satisfaction of what he was doing. Uh, so I had always admired him. And I, mm. I, it was a great opportunity to finally meet him. And then, after we did, we worked together a lot. Disney and... You uh, bet. Uh, yeah, I wrote well, a You things. said, it's because of Don Knotts that I'm in this business. Yeah. What did you learn from him? I think the gentleness and, and the relationship with an audience, that what an audience was really seeking was comedy, was a fun time. It didn't have to, you know, you didn't have to have the words and the nudity and the violence and all that. Mm -hmm. He just, you know, he could sit on a porch and just uh, talk with Andy and gosh, you know, it's a wonderful life. For 11 years you go on uh -huh. and the whole country really falls in love with you on the Carol Burnett yes. show. Five Emmys. Um, your work there, it's, it's really iconic <laughs> in television and hasn't been repeated. Why do you think people can't why was it never replicated? Why was that kind of the end of variety, kind yeah. of feel good? Well, uh, we can't seem to find anybody that would uh, head up a show like that. I mean, you're never going to find a Carol Burnett. 
Uh, Carol was the most generous star I have ever met. I mean, whatever we did on that show, if it was funny, you did it. It isn't like a, uh, she would say, well, that, that's hysterical, I'll be doing that. Um, <laughs> she just said, go. Whatever you think is good, go. Uh, Not a lot of rehearsal on the show. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, no. Uh, well, with the old man, for instance. Uh, they, mm -hmm. I was to play an old man at the end, and I'd come in, and I'd talk to Carol on the couch and leave. And uh, They had not seen the old man, because uh, I hadn't come up with anything yet. I'm just <laughs> walking around, you know, I thought, well, maybe I'll go be slow or whatever. And um, so the first time they saw it is when the door opened and out came this guy, and I was just supposed to walk to the couch, you know. Well, I started walking. <laughs> And I said, you know, if this goes any longer, we're going to be here a couple of days, you know. So I thought, you know, and I'm kind of looking toward the booth to see if they're going to say, you know, hey, enough of this. Let's, Cut. Yes, yeah, let's kind of speed this up a little bit. They didn't. So that was the creation of the old man, and that wow. continued after that. Uh, the Tud Ball and Mrs. Mr. Wiggins. Oh. Yeah. It, uh, Screamingly funny. It, where did that come from? Was that someone you'd met? Would, well, I mean, the Mises you week, this whole thing. This, where did you get that from? <laughs> well, my, as I said, my uh, godparents were Romanian, and that's kind of the way, I uh, guess, uh, some of it is from that. You know, you come down here to <laughs> have this, uh, you pass me that uh, rice over here. Um, and I guess that that kind of is where the voice came from. Mm -hmm. And. Um, the idea of the sketch, the only, the first one that I, I only thought we were going to do one, you know, so, uh, and Bob Mackey was the one who really created uh, Carol's character with the big butt <laughs> on the, yeah. Why are those sketches so timeless and don't leave yeah. people's memory? Well, I think if you look at them closely, we are not entertaining, uh, we're entertaining the audience, but we're not looking to see if they're being entertained. You know, we're just dealing with each other. If they're laughing, that's fine. When you look back at that time in television, mm -hmm. right, and I, I just did it the other day, All in the Family, mm -hmm. MASH, mm -hmm. then the Carol Burnett show, I mean, that was your, Bob Newhart, Bob Newhart, and then the Carol Burnett show, yeah. that was your lead-in. Right. This, I mean, you talk, people talk about the golden age of television. Yeah. Tim, yeah. you were the golden age of television, yes. as far as I'm concerned. We shut down a lot of stores on Saturday, that's for sure, because, you know, people wanted to stay home. And why not, you know? And also, in those days, when you watched, you had to watch television, because we mm -hmm. didn't have tape. So uh, if you wanted to talk about the show the next day, you had to be there to see it so that you could say, you know, I, mm -hmm. boy, they were really. Um, but it was such a community thing because your parents would sit there. A lot of people say, you know, that's the only time our parents ever talked to us is during the shows because, you know, mm -hmm. hey, that thing with the girl guy, you know. And the rest of the time they're just going, go, go to bed. Go to bed, know, get yeah, out of here. Get out of here, yeah. <laughs> uh, nowadays, I cannot watch television. I, I just, it is so annoying and insulting mm -hmm. on some of these shows and uh, you, especially with your children you know you're your in a room and, and even if you want to go from well I'm going to go switch a couple of channels there's always something that jumps up and then you go oh boy geez so uh, it's, it's it's tough. It's very frustrating. Yeah. It is it really is it's so stupid you know. You and Harvey Corman had yeah. a wonderful I mean, this was yeah. an Abbott and Costello relationship that you all had. It was classic comedy, and I think yeah. <clears throat> seeing you all on the I had the good fortune of seeing you all mm -hmm. on the road, and now this is available, uh, the, the, the Together Again tour. How long yeah. did you tour with this show? Uh, eight years. Yeah. Tell people about the show, and we'll show some clips of it. Well, Harvey was, uh, you know, uh, the reason he broke up so much, he's a very poor performer, you know, and I kept telling him that, you know, but uh, I had his number. I mean, all I had to do was look at him, <laughs> and he, he would was fall out. so long, yeah. And we had a close relationship, we still do, so um, mm -hmm. we could refer to a lot of things just by looking, uh, you know, at each other. And of course, he went south on me uh, quite a few times, but uh, I- On television and yes, live. I went to dinner last night, as a matter of fact, with Carol, and we were talking about those old days and, uh, you know, uh, how easy it was to break uh, Harvey up. He was supposed to be an old man who was sick one time, and he was, and I'm the old doctor going, eh, and I'm, we're face to face like this, and I look at his nose, and it's not in the script or anything, which was another thing. I would write one thing and then never say it because I was writing the scripts, <laughs> and he would never know where we were going, you know, so I'm <laughs> staring at his nose, and he goes, oh, what are you looking at? And I touch his nose, and I go, is that loaded? <laughs> So it didn't take much to have him go sideways. <laughs> to break him uh, yeah. up. And then, you, and then you go on the road, you took mm -hmm. all of the great, really, the classic yeah. moments from the <laughs> Carol Burnett show, the dentist sketch yeah. and, the, and the, um, the old man. 
and, and really brought them to life for people live. What was that like for you? What did you hear? Well, that? again, with the dentist sketch, I, we seldom showed anything until they actually taped the show. I mean, if you mm -hmm. had something you were saving, you saved it till they were taping the show because they didn't, you know, you couldn't, in order to edit a show in those days, you had a razor blade, you know, mm -hmm. try to go down the middle, glue it together, and, and it would mm -hmm. and jump and everything. So they, you know, they used to let a lot of stuff go. They like go, to see live, know? live to tape. So uh, with Harvey, well, in the dentist sketch, I wrote the, the dentist sketch, and uh, the last part of it with the Novocaine, I had never showed him. I didn't do that until we were actually taping it. And he said, you know, this sketch really stinks. It's there's nothing funny about this, and I said, well, you know, we'll, maybe when we get to the end, I got a little something. Ah, jeez, you know. <laughs> so he's sitting in the chair, and we get to the Novocaine, and so long. He just went totally south. Pull your tooth out. <laughs> Boy, this is gonna hurt. <laughs> Doctor, if it's gonna hurt, please give me something to kill the pain. Yeah. Okay. Well, got some Novocaine right here. Just, uh, hold on that, man. Let's see how this works here. Okay, Novocaine. Here we are, Novocaine. Take a firm hold of the hypodermic needle. Right. <laughs> ah. oh. There'll be a little bit of pain, and then numbness will set in. <laughs> I said, it's, that's great. Now, let's try it one more time without you laughing. He said, you think so? You sit out here. <laughs> We're trying <laughs> to do it. So I did something totally different in that one, which really confused him. And uh, that was with the fly uh. and all <laughs> things. So uh, it was, and Joe Hamilton, who was the uh, producer of the show, Carol's husband, and uh, Carol, did. they just, they loved it. You know, just do whatever you think is uh, funny, and away we go. It's a, it, well, it's an amazing moment, and to watch it live, yeah. you were still improvising <laughs> and trying yeah, to break right. him up. It, it wasn't as it was on the show. You were doing your own thing. You were still right. making other parts of your body fall asleep, and, oh. and, and, and he was still rolling. <laughs> yeah. But what, what was the reaction from people? What did you hear? Because I know there were a lot of fans oh, the, the day sketch, we went. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that really, you know, Joe, he got so many requests from dental schools. You know, because they wanted to show that. So it, you go to any college, and if you're in <laughs> in the dental part of uh, of the medical uh, education in that school, they will show you that because it, everybody plays that thing. And it really came from my dentist. You know, he was he was very young, and and it was like haircuts thing. You know, you could come in and have your teeth filled for nothing if you would let these guys work on you. So he had this Novocaine, and uh, you know he was pulling this guy's, lip and he went mm, like this, and he went through the guy's cheek oh. and into his thumb, which he didn't know, you know. And he goes, mm, "Okay, that's uh, whoa," you know. So from there, away we went. You, know, you, all, yes, you were off to the races. Yeah. Before yeah. we leave this whole topic of Carol mm -hmm. Burnett and the Carol Burnett show <clears throat> and that whole experience, even Carol tried to do a Carol and Company yes. uh, in the '90s. Right. Didn't. No, there was Didn't certain. We there. were the New York Yankees of comedy at the time because everybody was so in tune with the other person. Nobody mm -hmm. disliked somebody. We all mm -hmm. loved each other. We couldn't wait to get there on Monday. When you came in, you knew the script right away. You couldn't wait to get to the wardrobe and uh, you know, the makeup and everything. I just uh, it was it was a wonderful one, and it's all attributed to Carol because if you're the head man or the head woman. Mm -hmm. That's where it begins, and if you're annoying, that show is going to be annoying. I was at this freak show one time, and I, I saw these Siamese elephants. at the end of their trunks like that. And this uh, trainer would make them stand up on their back feet like that and they had their trunks stretched like that. And then this little monkey would come out. Walk out 
out there and dance a merengue right out there. <laughs> I kind of felt sorry for them. They couldn't go lock the other elephants when they go. <laughs> All they could do is just blow and go. Northern. But that sense of camaraderie, that sense of love that you mm -hmm. all had, do you think that's missing from this town? I mean, I've been on a lot of film sets. Yeah. There is not that <coughs> friendship. Yeah. Jim? I think the only one I've seen in many a year is Everybody Loves Raymond. I, I, I've seen them well, tape. Thank you for yeah, so. yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> is it Ray or Ray? Yeah, Ray, but Ray it can be yeah. either way. It's such a wonderful camaraderie that that cast has. I mean, yeah. It's pretty much like what we had. I mean, everybody really liked each other. Yeah. The comedy writing was genius. I mean, it really was. And you know, though, I'm married to an Italian, so I know those people <laughs> that they're talking about, you know. Uh, and it just. I watch it, you know, if it's on sometimes five or six times a night, I just sit there and let the whole thing go, you and, know. And yeah, watch them. Yeah. No, they were great. I, they were and fantastic. I just, the other stuff I just turn off in it, uh, you know. It's not that it's bad. It, it, again, is insulting. Tell me about your hidden talent, which we learn about in this book, which is you are a tailor. And <laughs> in a moment, we're going to show people just how, just Tailored how accomplished you are. <laughs> yes. Where did this come from? My mother was a seamstress, oh. and uh, sitting that long watching her sew, hmm. uh, I kind of picked it up, and uh, I would make clothes. You couldn't wear them out in public. Now, is this your normal attire when in this room? Yes. I come down here and relax. Uh, hmm. I have a uh, bedspread made oh. out of the same uh, <laughs> material, so I'm comfortable wherever it's on. As I read this book, it is such a sunny, fun romp really through mm. your life. There are great stories here, also a lot of insight into your, your personal life, your family, but it is a sunny portrait. What is the saddest moment in Tim Conway's life? Wow, Aside boy. from this interview. <laughs> well, this is pretty sad. Yes. <laughs> I know, I know it. <laughs> um, I think uh, like when my dog died, you know, mm. those are sad moments. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, my, uh, my parents never smack me or anything like that mm -hmm. uh, uh, because I was a perfect child. Well, that's what and, it is, uh, sure. Yeah. My mother actually said to my dad one time, uh, he's done this and he, she listed a whole bunch of things. And so my dad said, come here. So he went into my bedroom and he took off his belt and I thought, oh boy. Oh, oh here it comes. So he started whacking the bed and he said, you know, hmm? So I'm going, wow, man. <laughs> and my mother came out and said, well, you know, no, don't do that anymore. I said, I know. <laughs> so that's as bad as it got in the oh, Conway household. Oh, that's as bad as it got, yeah. That's not too bad. Yeah. And, and it's been an amazing, it's an amazing story. It's an amazing book. And what a life. What is the lesson that people should draw from Tim Conway's life and work? Well, you're only here once and uh, you've got to enjoy it. Uh, I know it's tough at times uh, because uh, outside elements uh, do make it rather restrictive, uh, mm -hmm. money and things of that nature, but uh, enjoy it while you're here. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, it's such a pleasure mm -hmm. to be involved with you. <laughs> Okay. And this whole crew. <laughs> Invading your yeah. home. I know. Yeah, this right. is probably the high. In fact, you could write another book just about <laughs> this experience, and I hope yes. you will. Tim Conway, you are a constant joy to so many. There's no question Tim, about sir, it. Uh, that's true. Certainly to our family and, and to so many others. Um, so I thank you for that and for the interview. Oh, thank you. Such a kind gentleman, and what a riot. His gift of laughter goes on. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the entire Conway family. May Tim Conway rest in peace. On a recent trip to the Middle East, Pope Francis issued a controversial statement on religious pluralism. Francis says diversity of world religions is willed by God, which appears to contradict 2,000 years of church teaching, leading some to suggest he's engaging in heresy. To discuss this and much more is Bishop Athanasius Schneider. He's the auxiliary bishop of Astana, Kazakhstan. Bishop, thank you for being here. Last week, Pope Francis met with women superiors uh, from 80 countries at the conclusion of the 21st Assembly of the International Union of Superior Generals in Rome. 
There he was asked about the possibility of women deacons by a German sister, and he said this, in regard to the diaconate, we must see what was there at the beginning of Revelation. If there was something, let it grow and it arrives. But if there was not, if the Lord did not want a sacramental ministry for women, it can't go forward. For this reason, we go to history and to dogma. We are Catholics, but if anyone wants to found another church, they are free to do so. Your reaction, Bishop? I'm very happy of these words of Pope Francis, and they are quite clear that there is no possibility of uh, a sacramental ordination of women, since the sacrament of ordination is one sacrament, which is in three parts. The first is the diaconate, and then the, the priestly ordination, and then the episcopal ordination. Mm -hmm. So it is theologically, dogmatically impossible to, to confer uh, to women the diaconate, one part. Otherwise, we, we should give them the second and the third part also. The, the Pope went on to speak about the development of doctrine in the Church, adding that the way we understand our faith today is better than in the pre-Vatican II period. There is development in our understanding, he said. Then he referred to the death penalty, saying, I have clearly stated that the death penalty is unacceptable. It is immoral. Fifty years ago, no. Has the Church changed? No. But there has been a development of moral consciousness. Do you think this applies to other teachings in the Catholic Catechism? First, we have to clear what does mean development in doctrine, the true sense. Mm -hmm. And the Church always taught that there can be development only under the condition that it remains the same meaning, the same sense mm -hmm. as before. So it could not be an evident, obvious contradiction. Mm -hmm. This will be not a, uh, a development, a true development of, of church doctrine, mm -hmm. of understanding. For example, as you brought the example of this penalty, it is uh, to state now that this penalty is in se, in itself, immoral, it contradicts, obviously, the entire 2000 teaching of the Church. And this is not development, mm. but contradiction, evident contradiction. There can be uh, development in applying some truth concretely. Yeah. For example, to apply uh, the death penalty, they can differ how we do concretely and practically apply the death penalty penalty. Mm -hmm. But there cannot be a difference on the principle itself. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned earlier, in February, during his trip to Abu Dhabi, Pope Francis, together with the Grand Imam, signed a document on human fraternity uh, for world peace and living together. That was the name of the document. In it, there was a controversial passage that reads, the pluralism and the diversity of religions, color, sex, race, and language are willed by God in his wisdom, through which he created human beings. What did you find troublesome in that paragraph? And you did. The phrase itself, at its reads, it's logically and theologically wrong. The diversity of the male and female sexes as well as the diversity of races, mm -hmm. is something which is in itself positive and directly willed by God. We read in Holy Scripture, male and female, he made them. Mm -hmm. And God saw everything which he had made, and it was really good. So the word of God. Regarding diversity of religions, on the contrary, God explicitly said that the diversity of religions is in itself bad and contradicts 
his divine wisdom and will. Yeah. Diversity of religions, moreover, offends God. Your Excellency, I know you brought your concerns about this document and this statement to the Holy Father himself uh, at a March meeting. He said that you could go forward and clarify the, the difference between uh, the, the will of God and the permissive will of God, and that that would clear things up. Now, since that meeting, uh, the, the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue have asked Catholic University pr professors to distribute this statement. Now, the phrase in question was not formally corrected. The document was sent out to universities. Do you believe there needs to be a correction made, a public correction? There is, there is very much needed need a public correction because, as the phrase reads in itself, it is ambiguous. And not only ambiguous, it is wrong. It is logically wrong to state in the same breath the diversity of female, male and female sexes and the diversity of religions. Mm. It is impossible to read this phrase without an official correction. Mm -hmm. Your Excellency, this statement on religious diversity and the teaching in Amoris Laetitia that allows communion to divorced and remarried Catholics without an annulment have been cited as evidence that the Pope has committed heresy in a new open letter. Now, this was signed by scholars and theologians. Do you believe that this really rises to the level of heresy? No, because a heresy is a formal statement which uh, denies uh, in formal speech uh, um, a revealed truth. And so the Pope did not deny publicly mm -hmm. and explicitly uh, the indissolubility of marriage. Mm -hmm. And so therefore he cannot be mm, accused of heresy mm -hmm. in this concrete theme. But he, with his permission, which he, with his approval of the norms of the Argent, Argentine bishops, mm -hmm. which in some cases allow the access of uh, people living in adultery to Holy Communion, mm -hmm. with this approval of the Pope, he in practice is denying the truth, not by words. Mm but also only specifically for a region. He did not approve a general norm for the entire church. So we have to distinguish these levels. Mm -hmm. So is this letter an appropriate instrument to correct a pope? Did they go too far calling for the pope's resignation in that open letter? Yes, I think they, got, they went too far. Mm -hmm. uh, because, to my opinion, they had to, they cannot, uh, themselves state that this is heresy. Um, the authors of the letter, mm -hmm. uh, they cannot by themselves state that this is a heresy because all the items which they were listed, list, listed up, there were no formal um, there was no formal delict of heresy of the Pope, mm -hmm. of Pope Francis. Right. Uh, uh, but there were, there were a, a, a lot of uh, ambiguities, mm -hmm. I would say, more ambiguities and practical collaboration in the spre spreading of, of wrong teaching in the church. Mm -hmm. And so this is the f a fact of. Uh, uh, therefore, they have to be very careful in accusing the Pope of formal heresy. Mm. Uh, uh, final question. Have... Final question, Bishop, uh, before I let you go, because we're running out of time. Uh, this Amazon conference is coming up in October. Now, you spent some time in this part of the world. The argument here is that given the priest shortage in the region, the only thing, the only relief for this is to bring married men into the priesthood, to make up for the shortage. Is that a legitimate solution in your mind? No, it is a deceit. It is a, a, a pure human um, solution, a practical human, I would even say worldly solution, yeah. because 
I myself lived in the Soviet time, in times we had no priests for decades, hmm. but we lived our Catholic faith in the domestic church. Hmm. And there were sometimes a priest came and uh, gave us the sacraments maybe once a year. And, and even so, the church, the underground church in the Soviet time, in other times of the church history, where there were uh, a shortage of priests, they kept the faith mm -hmm. very uh, strong and they transmitted the faith. And therefore, we have already a clear proof and demonstration from the history of the mm -hmm. church that uh, it, God provides with uh, his graces yeah. even people who are longing for a priest. Yeah. And therefore, the solution is to, f to strengthen the families, the domestic church, yeah. and then to pray for holy priestly vocations. Bishop Athanasius Schneider, I thank you so much for your time this evening. Uh, we'll get together again, and we'll get a clearer connection next time, I promise. God bless you. Thank you. Before we go, this week I had such a wonderful visit to St. Stephen's School in New Orleans. To be able to spend the morning talking about Will Wilder and the adventure of reading with such incredible young people literally made my week. Their excitement, perceptive questions was simply amazing. Thank you for having me, St. Stephen's. And don't forget, summer reading season is almost here. Will Wilder 3 and the entire Will Wilder series makes an incredible gift to your young adventurer or to your family this summer. It's available now at bookstores everywhere and online at the EWTN Religious Catalog. That's all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. You can like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. I'll bring you the latest news there. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.